Hey guys, this is John Rivera from GamingInstincts.com and welcome back to my Let's Play of Resident Evil on the Sega Saturn. Now where we last left off, I basically fought my way through the garden and made it to the guardhouse and that's where we are right now. Now I'm going to continue my sojourn through the guardhouse and see what I might find. I know that I will eventually have to contend with the Plant 42 creature as well as Project Neptune, which is essentially a gigantic mutated shark. So, let me get some items in here. Let's see. Let's throw this in here. And I think I'll stick with this. Yeah. I think I'll go with this. Actually, let's stash my... Yeah, let's stash my combat knife. Actually, no, never mind. I might need that to take out zombies, if need be. Now, to be honest, I have done a preliminary search through the first two rooms of the guardhouse, San's safe room. So, I pretty much went through the, the pool table room, the, the rec room. I took the ink ribbon, as you could see, in my inventory. And I also took the explosive rounds from the same room without getting too moffed up by the spiders. And I believe I took everything that needed to be taken from here. I could be wrong, but let's just double check, just in case. Something that's interesting about this track is that the instrumentation is a little different. I can't really put my finger on it, but something is slightly different from the instrumentation of this particular track and the same track from the PS1 version. There's more of a twinge to the 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 xylophone tones. I don't know, it's just something I found to be interesting. And I think that's everything of interest in this particular area. Let's go in here and check and see if I got everything from here. By the way, my apologies about the lack of frequency of the uploads, but I have been quite busy. And uh, one of the reasons why, uh, the bathtub is filled with water, muddy water. Will you unplug it? Yes. So one of the reasons why um, I've been waiting for this, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, um, but if you are familiar with this, you'll know that it's an Applejack controller. And that's the special controller that's for use with the Apple Pippin console. So I actually bought one of these uh, not too long ago, and I finally have a Pippin. What am I going to do with it? I don't know. Uh, it was an interesting console, and I really wanted to experience it. I've, I've watched a lot of videos on YouTube on it, and I don't know. It's just an interesting little console. So, Plus, there are like, there are like four or five games for the Pippin that I really wanted to play, and I don't think there exist any Pippin emulators on the internet. Like anywhere on the web so I mean in order to make an emulator you actually have to have the machine to open up to examine all the innards and to be honest I don't think anybody with the know-how to reverse engineer a Pippin actually owns a Pippin and is willing to put down that money for it but but I really wanted one so I bought it and so Hopefully I can figure out how to burn games on it. I've been talking to Adam Korolik from Figure It Out Productions. If you guys have not checked out his channel, I highly recommend it. He's just a very passionate, knowledgeable guy. And he just knows his stuff inside and out. So I've been in contact with him. I've actually been kind of pestering him. I feel bad about it. Um, <laughs> just trying to figure out how to get burnt pippin games to work on the console so hopefully in the future i'll get that nut cracked but until then you know resident evil folks
All right, so. I'm serious about checking out Adam Korolik's channel. It's whatever you need to know about games, like retro and modern. He just, he has an answer to any of your questions, so. He also has like a really, really cool series of breakdown videos on the various console generations. So he's, he's done one on the, the 7th, the 6th, and he's also done breakdowns of... Ooh, I don't know if I got that. Maybe I did. Yep. Oh, no, maybe not. Okay. Well, crap. Alright, I'm still fine. Whatever. Yeah, but he's done breakdowns on consoles from... From the 7th to the... I think the the third. So, yeah, he did uh, the GX4000, which was really interesting because I'd never seen a video with the GX4000. Aside from, there was like one other video that I had seen. And it's a British guy. So it was interesting to get like an American perspective. Will you push the keys? Yes, I will. Yeah, but he's a very smart guy. I highly recommend checking out his channel. Just had to pause right there. Because there are going to be bees. Sure. Okay, so apparently I can't do this puzzle yet. Something is written on the wall. Water equals one, red equals two, purple equals three, green equals four, and I believe that's it. Something is written on the wall. What a surprise. 1 plus 2 equals 3, 3 plus 4 equals 7, 2 plus 4 equals 6, 7, 6 plus 7 equals 13, 13 plus 3 equals 16. <clears throat> Excuse me. Alright, so... Oh god, the frame rate! <laughs> the frame rate just took a dive. And that is because... Bees! Alright, gotta get out of here. Gotta get out of here. Gotta, gotta grind. Gotta grind. By the way, that's like a little inside joke between like my brother and I. We used to play Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 for the PS1. And <laughs> at, at basically the 9 second left mark... We both were like, oh, gotta grind, gotta grind. Because if you, if you start grinding and uh, you stay on the grind and you just do ollies and do flip tricks and, and grab tricks and then go back into the grind, you'll stay in gameplay even though the timer's still counting down or the timer's completely out of time and you're done. But if you land your trick successfully, then you get, you know, you get your points. So that was always like a, a last minute down to the wire, you know, last ditch effort. So I gotta grind, gotta grind. God, I missed that game. It's a real damn shame that Tony Hawk 5 was just a piece of crap. Or I believe it was Tony Hawk 5. I don't know. It was like the last Tony Hawk game that Activision just like shat out because their license was going to run out very soon at that point. 
So they just... <laughs> they just squirted that game onto the market, hoping that it would stick. And lo and behold, it didn't. Such a shame. Yeah, Plant42 report talks about the V-Jolt that I'll need. And I might as well get this out of the way right here and now. So this ladder leads down to the, the root system of the facility. But it also has the tank, the water tank in it, that houses the Project Neptune creature. Which is, like I said, the, gi the gigantic mutated shark. And this music track is just so chilling. Great track. Great, great track. Very atmospheric. And I believe there's something a little different with the instrumentation of this particular track, too, in comparison to the PlayStation. I could be wrong again, but I believe there is a, a slight difference in the instrumentation of it. Not the arrangement, but the sound samples used, or maybe the quality of them, or maybe just uh, how they're finalized. I, I don't know much about music production, especially on older systems, but... There is something different about this track on Saturn. It's so interesting. I always thought that this console generation was one of the last definitive console wars. And I don't just mean in terms of like playground discussions or arguments or, you know, arguments on the forums back then or on the well. Um, there was something very interesting about this generation. And not just with the PlayStation, Sega Saturn, and N64, I mean, other stuff, including the, Ad the, you know, the Apple Pippin. There was just really interesting stuff going on. A lot of, basically a lot of failed experiments happening in the fifth generation of gaming. Alright, I'm going to stop talking for a second because I could potentially die right here. Let's check my health real quick. Okay, it's do or die. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me, I'm dying. Alright, gotta run. Gotta grind, gotta grind, gotta run. Okay, there he is. Oh! Piss off! Oh, gotta, gotta go. Gotta, must go faster. Must go faster, just like Jeff Goldblum would say. Whew! Yes, yes, I'm, uh, yeah. Alright. Get in there! <laughs> Have you guys ever watched Jurassic Park? Where he's like, must go faster, must go faster. Jeff Goldblum. That guy's awesome. He's my hero. Well, not really, but he is, he is an interesting actor. There's a lever. Will you move it? Sure, why not? I love, you know, I, I never touched on it because I was too busy getting munched on by Project Neptune, but it's funny how the run animation is like, yo, we just cut half the frames out. There you go. You're underwater. <laughs> My, how, how times have changed. There's a sound from the room next door. All right, so... Now that I have that taken care of, Project Neptune is no more than just a, a dumb fish gasping for air right now. Where are you? Yeah, so this is the tank right here. The tank appears to have cracked. Yeah. Thank you, Captain Obvious. I couldn't tell by this thing, plus it's two little babies right here trying to kill me.
I'm not gonna lie, the first time I ever played this game and I got to this point and faced Project Neptune, um, I was not ready and I got eaten. I was completely caught off guard. I had no idea what, <laughs> like, what was happening. <laughs> At first, I thought it was a glitch. I thought, I'm like, is this a glitch? What, what's going on here? What? All right, so there's a key right here. Will you take the dormitory key? Yes, I will. All right, so as you can see toward the back of the room in the center right here, you can see that there are some shotgun shells, but I'm not going to pick those up just yet. And the reason why is because I need room in my inventory because the next puzzle uh, involves basically hurting the plant monster and I'll show you right here and behind this blue door there is basically the the foundation the fundamental root system of plant 42 and so we need to create some V jolt in order to weaken the root system and weaken plant 42 as the as a result it looks like a plant root. <laughs> oh, Jill. Top grade sleuthing in this, this stars department. Especially if you guys remember, remember the, the previous episode. If you guys remember correctly, Barry Burton's like, Here, take this. It's, <laughs> it's very effective, especially against living things. Well, it's like, no shit. What else are you going to use it on? Trees? Like, well, Plant 42 is a plant, so I, I guess you got me there. Still, what a redundant thing to say, right? It It's very effective, especially against living things. Like, what? How does that not make you chuckle? Yes, I will climb the ladder. having so much trouble getting up those ladder those rungs of the ladder all right did I go in here just yet I don't think I did let's take care of this <clears throat> oh no zombies Nice. Not bad. Not bad. I wish I didn't misfire the first shot, but... Eh, whatever. Can't win for losing? Uh, let's see. No water is left. Nothing special. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now, since we've taken care of Project Neptune, let's see, now I can go into Dormitory 003, I think, I think that's the name of it. <clears throat> All right, let's do this. Really, one of the biggest hurdles is taking care of Project Nept Neptune, and then after Neptune, I'm going to save, and then, you know, just to be sure that, you know, everything is well. Let, yes, let's discard that key. Let's enter the dormitory. Man, that music is so creepy. Uh, 
I do not think that there are any zombies in here. Okay. Nope. The desk is locked. Will you use the lock pick? Sure. What is that? Oh, it's another ink ribbon. Sweet. I'm not going to take it just yet. I need that inventory space for the puzzle. A row of red books. There's one white book. Will you take it? Do I want to? Here we go. The Jolt Report. As I stated in the last report, there are some common features found in the cells of the plant infected by the T-Virus, or Tyrant Virus. We also have found another interesting fact through some experiments. We found an element that destroys these plant cells rapidly in UMB number 16, one of the series of UMB or umbrella chemicals that we used for that experiment. We named this UMB number 16 as V-Jolt. In our calculation, it will take less than five seconds to destroy plant 42 if you if we put V-Jolt directly on the root. Okay. Um, you will need to mix uh, you need to mix some of the UMB chemicals in the specific order in order to create V-Jolt. But the UMB series chemicals may generate a poisonous gas which is harmful to the human body. Extreme caution should be taken when handling these chemicals. Following... <laughs> Not following, but the following are the types of UMB series chemicals and their brief characteristics. Uh, UMB number two, red, NP003, purple. Uh, UMB number four, green. Yellow six, yellow. UMB number seven, white. UMB number 13, blue. Stimulating smell. V jolt. UMB number 16 brown okay so that those are basically the rules for the puzzle you, you have four bottles to choose from or that you have at your disposal in order to mix the different chemicals in order to get V jolt a new book is missing or a book is missing all right <clears throat> excuse me all right let's check this side room real quick because I'm sure that there is a zombie in here that we'll have to destroy and then possibly an item. Right? Yep! Zombie! Nice. That was that was close. I was like this close to being a, a zombie happy meal. Or a Jill sandwich. Who came up with that? Nothing major about this washstand. I can't tell you the last time I ever saw a washstand in a home. Nothing special. Dust collects inside. The bath towel is dirty. Okay. So that's that. So let's go back to this room. <clears throat> so let's make ourselves some V-Jolt. V-Jolt. Sounds like an energy drink, right? Like V-Jolt. All right, how much inventory space do I have? Sweet, four more spaces. Nice. Mm. Will you take the empty bottle? Yes, I will. <clears throat> I 
Okay, so now I have the four bottles, and I still have one inventory space to spare. Not bad. Will you put water in in, an, in the empty bottle? Yes, I will. All right, let's... There's a UMB number two. Will you put UMB two in the empty bottle? Yes, I will. All right, so I'm going to mix these two together. Water combined with this. Something is written on the wall. Okay. There's a UMB number four. Will you put UMB number four in the empty bottle? Yes, I will. All right, so now that I've taken care of the shark and now I'm on this puzzle, um, back to talking about the generation. This generation was exceedingly interesting. Not just in terms of, well, let's see, 2 plus 4 equals 6. Yeah. There's a UMB number 2. The reason why it was interesting was because the consoles still had a wide range of difference between one another. Not just in terms of their look or their software identity, but the way they handled their graphical capabilities or the graphical capabilities that each one had were kind of significantly different from one another. They handled graphics in their own special way. Let's combine this with this. This with this, right? Yeah. UMB number 13. So now I need another three. There's a UMB number two. As you can see in this version of Resident Evil, this game clearly handles 3D in a different way. As I mentioned in previous episodes, there are interesting workarounds that this version uses in order to make RE Saturn happen. In other words, like I said, you know, some elements are Gorod shaded. Uh, most of the character or all of the character models had to be redone in quadrilaterals because of the Sega Saturn's inability to draw triangles, geometrically speaking. Let's see. Combine this with this, and now I have the jolt. I wonder if V-Jolt is like like Mountain Dew uh, game fuel. You know, it's like a blast of citric cherry. Alright, so now I'm going to go back in here, right? Or was it... Mm, no, not here. It's the previous dormitory room. My mistake. Yeah, this isn't it. Because this one has the bookshelf that moves over to reveal the secret entrance way to Plant 42. And I'm not ready to fight Plant 42 right now. I mean, it's interesting to examine the the second, third, and fourth generations of gaming, but the fifth is just, I mean, it was just, three, 3D graphics and gaming was such a new thing. I mean, you saw it in the previous generation. You saw it in the fourth generation. You know, 
stuff like the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo, they, they were both doing 3D in their own special way, but it was very much a heavily experimental science. It was, it was an unproven science at the time. I mean, the 3D age might have started with the fourth generation of systems, but... And, and I mean that, like, that's obviously a relative statement to make, because obviously 3D games have been in the industry since before the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis. Uh, there were other games being made using vector-based 3D and stuff. But when it comes to texture-mapped and gorod-shaded and you know, flat shaded polygon graphics. I mean, this was pretty much the time where things were starting to heat up in the ways of, you know, 3D graphics. You could say that Star Fox sowed the seeds and that uh, virtual racing for the Sega Genesis, the game that was powered by the Sega, what was it, the Sega uh, Visual processor or something like that it, it was I, i'm not sure what the acronym is but it's known as the sega uh, uh svp so like you know they were they were really trying to pioneer and and shepherd along those sort of graphics through that that i guess rudimentary tech But you could just look at a game, a game that predominantly uses polygonal 3D graphics on the Saturn, uh, on the Saturn PlayStation, as well as the N64. And it's pretty easy to tell between the different games. In fact, if you look at, if you look at third party titles that came out on the N64, the Sega Saturn and the PlayStation, it's actually pretty easy to tell which one goes to which platform or which one came out on which platform i think the best example of such a thing would be wipeout excel or wipeout 2097 or if you look at just the original wipeout there was a saturn version and then there was a playstation version when you look at the two versions they're clearly different and in, in, they have slight differences between the two of them and yes, I will climb up this ladder. Come on, Jill, get up those rungs. Like the PlayStation version has particle effects, albeit rudimentary particle effects, but the Sega Saturn doesn't. But the Sega Saturn doesn't have such an issue with perspective correct texturing as the PlayStation does. And that's like the texture jiggle and wobble that you see at certain vantage points when you're racing along the track. You can sort of see like, you sort of see a distortion and it's clear as day. But in the Saturn version, it's not as pronounced, but the Sega Saturn version cannot do particle effects. It's using two dimensional sprites for different to simulate particle effects whether it be um weapon effects or the effects of the afterburner coming off of the the craft itself and in a lot of ways you do see some of those issues with you know this version of resident evil let's see what am i going to do now i can obviously fight against plant 42 but I think I'm going to go back to the safe room. And of course I'm going to get attacked by this plant tentacle. Which sucks, but whatever. Ah! Ah! It miraculously changed position, the statue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back off. Danger. 
danger. All right, so first things first, I'm going to move that statue to the proper position to cover up that hole. I am not getting attacked by that thing again. I refuse. Jill, you can do it. Oh my gosh, Jill, what are you doing, Jill? Yes, there we go. Let's test it out. Yes! So we made it through that ordeal. So we took care of Plant 42's root system. We took care of Project Neptune. Screw that shark. Um, let's see. Let's get this. We're going to need that red book. Let's get that red book. And we're going to need the bazooka. Right, there we go. Acid rounds, let's take those. Explosive rounds, let's take those. Okay. And the rest will be herbs. So once I put that red book in the bookcase, I've got another inventory slot, so... And I'm pretty sure that... I'm pretty sure that there are some... Uh, some... Some incendiary rounds somewhere. Disturbs. Yeah, there we go. Actually, let's put these back. I'm not going to need these. Well, shoddy just in case. Who knows? I might need it. And I'm going to save my game, just in case. You can save your progress with this. Will you use the ink ribbon? Yes, I will. So, at the beginning of the episode, I was talking about how I pretty much lost the original fourth episode. Well, um, basically, I had been leaving my Sega Saturn on, so that way I could keep my progress, because the Sega Saturn, unfortunately, requires the use of NVRAM, non-volatile uh, random access memory. That pretty much means that this console has internal storage, which on paper sounds awesome. Unfortunately, it relies on the juice of a PC battery. If you guys have ever seen like uh, like those coin-shaped batteries that you put on the motherboard of your PC, and basically what that battery does is keeps a charge for your motherboard that's just enough to preserve the internal clock of the machine. Same, same mentality here except there's even more juice being expended 
preserving the data that's imprinted on the NVRAM chip, the non-volatile random access memory chip. Um, that's not entirely a bad idea, except the energy usage is quite substantial. That being said, it only takes like a few months for the system battery of a Sega Saturn to die, to run out of juice. Um, I've had the Sega Saturn for years, not months. So the system battery does not work on it. Hasn't for quite some time. Don't worry, I've checked it. The battery does not leak. Shows no signs of leaking. So it's just in there as a placeholder. <coughs> Unfortunately, there was a, not a power outage, but there was like a brownout. And I noticed this because both my machines were on their startup screens, both my computers, my PCs, were on their startup screens, as were my Sega Saturn was at the Resident Evil title logo. Which I found to be suspect because I left it paused in the safe room in the guardhouse. So, basically when I went to load my game, I found that all my saves had been erased. Not cool. So I basically had to get back to the guardhouse with the same equipment. So I had two different attempts. And that was involving having to dodge the snake, to get the crest, having to open up the door, contend with the, the Cerberus zombie dogs. Yeah, it was just... Um, it wasn't fun. For, for, for a moment, Resident Evil on the Saturn was not fun. So... Um, for future reference, food for thought, before you start a Sega Saturn playthrough, make sure you have your battery in there. Isn't that right, Jill? Yeah. All right. No. Am I missing something? I've got to be missing something. I thought there were incendiary rounds somewhere. Oh, right here. Flame rounds. Sorry, not incendiary rounds. Flame rounds. Sorry, I don't want to misquote. All right, here goes nothing. Gonna fight Plant 42. We'll see what happens. All right, let's do this. I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm gonna do it. Nice! Boss. How many rounds did I, did I use? All six. Not bad. Not bad at all. I know that's a sin, me asking how many rounds did I use. I should have been counting rounds, I know. But when you're in a situation like that, and you're fighting this gigantic-ass plant, you're not really thinking about counting rounds. I know you should be, but... Mansion key. Nice. Well, that could have been worse. I've done worse, too. My previous episode 4 was not as elegant. Let's just leave it at that. Going back to that question, that age-old question, how many rounds did I use? Uh, 
the answer to that question for the original episode 4, I used all of them. And I still did not kill Plant 42. I've got no idea how the hell that happened. But I, I was really sucking it up during that playthrough. Not, not my proudest moment. <laughs> Whoa. What is this? Oh! Wesker. It's Albert Wesker. Jill. So you're safe. That's what I was going to say to you. <laughs> Where have you been? You disappeared from the hall all of a sudden. I'm sorry, but I have my reasons. Perhaps you guys have met them? Is that the game itself slowing down or is the the keyframes chopped in half? It's almost as if he knows that there are Hunter Alphas infesting the mansion as they were speaking. Because that's exactly what I'm going to have to deal with once I get back to the mansion. Uh, what? Oh. <laughs> Giggle. <laughs> Giggle. Okay. All right, so that was a successful run, I think. Uh, we, we dealt with Plant 42. And how many rounds did I use? Six. Not bad. I mean, those were six direct hits. You can't do much better than that with the bazooka. I mean, you miss once. And it just takes the wind out of your sails. So. Alright, let's... Let's do this. Let's put this away. Put this away. All right, so I am going to I'm going to run around the guardhouse and kind of scrounge for some supplies cuz I left quite a few of them. I really love this system, the Sega Saturn. Yeah, it's got some flaws and yeah, it was a commercial failure, but this was a console that just had a very killer identity. And it did have some amazing exclusives on, on the system. I mean, Burning Rangers. Dragon Force. A stall is pretty good. Mr. Bones is pretty fun. It's not really good, but I, I still think it's fun. Alright, so I'm going to go through room by room and just double check everything, make sure I have all the items and stuff. Let's equip my pistol. Whoops, don't do that. There we go. It's so fascinating. I mean, looking at this game in retrospect, this is a game that should not have worked back in 96. It really shouldn't have. But it did. And not to, not only does it work back in 96, like, thinking retrospectively, but it's a concept that still works now. It's amazing 
how you can make a game experience that is in terms of the action game conventions kind of flawed but you wrap it up in like you tie it up in an atmospheric bow that is uh, very horrific very scary and it turns into a brand new experience not to say that resident evil was the first survival horror game far from the first i think historically speaking uh the first game that could possibly have been branded as a survival horror game was uh, project firestart for the commodore 64 i mean that that was a survival horror game you're using underpowered weapons you have limited ammunition you're trapped on a space station there are mutant aliens i mean it's it's a survival horror game i mean it has all the staples of the genre before this before the genre was even established so so yeah project firestart was the prototypical survival horror game all the staples were there And then Infogroms came out with Alone in the Dark, which cemented the whole, I guess, aesthetic framework of what Resident Evil would make popular or would perfect or at least innovate. The whole use of only 3D polygonal characters being made out of like dynamic, actual rendered 3D and the backgrounds being pre-generated using invisible walls that weren't texture mapped. I mean, that very intelligent design involved in that game. Let's see. Two more inventory spaces. Let's... There's nothing in this desk, is there? Yeah, it is. Yeah, there is something in there. Nice. Got some shells. Might as well get the shells downstairs, too. I'm going to need those. There you go, Jill. Where are those herbs? Okay, they're right there. But yeah, this game should not have worked for 1996. And, and one of the reasons why... <clears throat> excuse me. One of the reasons why this game shouldn't have worked... Was because... It, it was still kind of a niche sort of genre... Like, survival horror was a very niche genre. And the prevailing game design paradigm of the time was not to make an experience that was one that made the player feel helpless. It was supposed to be a power fantasy, as, the, as they're called. Something like Earth Defense Force 2017 or 2025. Games like that. Any way that you could deliver a power fantasy experience and empower the player, that's how game design was from the beginning to the mid-90s. I mean, that was, that was pretty much the order of the day. Now, Hideo Kojima, he was definitely an exception because he basically pioneered the whole stealth action genre with Metal Gear on the MSX2 which was later ported over to the NES uh, back in, like, I think it was 1988 that the NES version came out. I could be wrong. Uh, I don't know right off the top of my head. But that was the, really the only other game I can think of back then that actually sold decently well in North America that did not have a power fantasy uh, design philosophy behind it. Everything else was like, you shot the enemy until they died. You stomped on them. Uh, you hit them with something. There's always 
a feeling of empowerment. And it wasn't until like Alone in the Dark came out on PC where people were like, okay, you know, I the odds are against me. I really shouldn't survive. I shouldn't be able to survive, but there is a possibility that I could. You know, and I guess, you know, that worked. Surprisingly enough, that, that concept actually worked. So th there was some sort of groundwork being laid out with stuff like Project Firestart for C64. Then there was Capcom's own Sweet Home, a survival horror RPG that is kind of the, the I guess, the prototype, like the primordial jelly of Resident Evil. And this is basically the missing link between like between the the crude survival horror and possibly the perfection of it with Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil Code Veronica. But that's just me thinking out loud, so. Twenty one shells. That's not bad. Let's see, let's see, do I have any more shells? Okay. Those are a lot of shells, but I'm going to need them. I'm definitely going to need them. All right, let's put these away. Pick up some herbs. Pluck some herbs. And then smoke them. Now, you guys might be wondering what my favorite Resident Evil game is, and I'll tell you. It's very, very close between Code Veronica and 2. But I have to say that 2, Resident Evil 2 is my favorite of the entire franchise. And I'll explain why when I get to uh, reviewing that, or not reviewing it, but doing a Let's Play of it. There's just a lot of, there, there's just a great deal of aesthetic improvements and just, I mean, there's so much meat to that game. It's ridiculous. Now, when I play through that game, I'm only going to be playing through the, uh, the scenario A campaign. And I'm going to be playing as Jill Valentine. So I'm not going to be playing as Leon S. Kennedy for scenario B with Mr. X and stuff. I wish I could. But unfortunately, I don't have the time for that. Um, maybe one of these days I'll do another playthrough with Leon S. Kennedy as the B scenario. And I can save that progress on a memory card. I'm not going to have to worry about the PS1 erasing my files because of NVRAM. So. Alright, so. Alright, so let's see there's ammunition in here I think I already grabbed it but I'm just gonna jump I'm just gonna double check <clears throat> yeah already uh, yeah I already grabbed it so we're coming up on an hour right now 
And to be honest, I think we're doing pretty good. I think we're in good shape. We didn't really take that much damage in the guardhouse. So I took more damage uh, in the garden, I think, than in the guardhouse. But I could be wrong. Alright, so those are taken. I do need to grab those herbs downstairs in the basement where the uh, the Neptune monster is. Or the room just before the Project Neptune monster. <clears throat> Let's double check in here. Because you never know. Nope, I got everything in here. Already got everything. So I already got the shells downstairs, so all that's left for me to get, I think, are the herbs. I think. Love this music. Aha! There you guys are. Alright, let's skedaddle. I think I've spent enough time in this guardhouse. Now it's time to make our way back. But that is for another episode. So I'm going to get back to the safe room and then I'll close out this episode. To be honest, I think this was a more successful recording of an episode 4 than my previous attempt, so I'm actually okay with having to scrap an entire episode's work, because I, I don't think you guys would have enjoyed it particularly all that well. So, there's that. I really hate putting out work that I'm not proud of. And I don't think that first recording was something to be proud of, so. Alright, folks. Gonna stash these items and then say sayonara. Alright guys, so I think that was a pretty productive run right there. I, I took care of Plant 42, Neptune, that damn <laughs> that piece of shit shark, um, Project Neptune. And after that, I'm going to sojourn all the way back to the mansion, which is going to be flooded with hunters. Those, uh, if you if you remember the, the Keeper's Diary, the guy talks about having to feed pigs or having to feed the hunter alphas pigs and they looked like gorillas that had no skin yeah so basically i'm going to be facing off the, with those things and, and there's also another type of creature and i believe it is a variant of the hunter alpha that is exclusive to this sega saturn version so that's another thing i will have to contend with and that's something that i'm not I, I don't have the 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 best recollection of of 
because I mean my my memory lies with the PlayStation 1 version even though I played this version uh, once in my childhood I actually played the PS1 version more because that was the version that my friend and I would play since he never had a Sega Saturn we just played his long box PS1 version which is a bit different from the Sega Saturn version it doesn't have that extra creature type and it doesn't have the the battle um, mini game in it it was like a it's like a final battle or something like that extreme battle sorry that's the name of it extreme battle so anyway that being said um, Jill say goodbye nothing but sass um, this is John Rivera from Gaming Instincts signing off, saying thank you guys so much for, for watching this episode and bearing with me as I corrected my mistake. Like I said, I don't enjoy putting out work that I'm not proud of. And, you know, even though I'm kind of bushed right now and you could probably tell with my speech, I appreciate you guys bearing with me and uh, sticking with me. Uh, this is something that I've wanted to do for a long time and. You know, now that I'm working at Gaming Instincts, I now have the opportunity and I have the freedom to do all of this stuff that I've never really had the chance to do before. So thanks to, you know, Leo. And speaking of Leo, be sure to check out his videos. He just started a Let's Play of Final Fantasy 15, and he's been working hard on it. He's on his sixth episode recording. So he's, you know, he's he's pumping it out. And like I said, He's actually funny compared to me, so there's that. Um, he's definitely getting an interesting experience out of that game. Uh, I can tell you right now, he he absolutely recognizes that it's completely it's a horse of a different color when it compared to the other Final Fantasy games. So he's definitely um, it that's definitely sinking in for him. So, but. Like I said, be sure to check out his playthrough of Titanfall. He just finished it. And also check out his FF15 Let's Play when it goes live on the Gaming Instincts YouTube channel. And if you guys want to stay on top of what's happening with Gaming Instincts in terms of gaming news, written reviews, as well as video features like our Let's Plays, be sure to tune in. Be sure to check out GamingInstincts.com. That's www.GamingInstinctsNoSpace.com. So, again, this is John Rivera signing off saying thank you guys again for watching. And, as always, I'll see you guys next time.